Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit that we come this morning. We ask you again to be here with us tonight, Lord, in our service as we lift up your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
source of him. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you that you're our firm foundation, God, when the world seems to be shifting sands, Lord God, and there seems to be nothing firm under our feet. God, we can stand on the rock, Christ Jesus, and know that you're faithful, know that you're sovereign, know that you're there, you're as close as a mention of your name. Lord, we just thank you for that tonight. Thank you that you are our cornerstone, Jesus. You're holding this whole building together, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just pray that you're lifted up in this place, Lord, tonight. That you'd be magnified, that you'd be exalted by our praise and our worship. Lord, we just want you to show up. We want you to inhabit the praises of your people and speak to our hearts tonight. Let us leave challenged and refreshed and changed because of what you would do by your spirit in this place tonight. We thank you for it, God, in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Again, I don't plan on keeping you long. 
uh, just until the Lord's done tonight. Uh, make a great claim on God. That's what I want to share tonight. Make a great claim on God. If you could ask for anything you wanted for your birthday this year, what would you ask for? You have some ideas? <laughs> Things that you've always wanted? It used to be, when I was a child, to ask for a pony at your birthday party was a big birthday party, right? <laughs> and it was expensive to, to get something like that on your birthday when I was a kid. Or to have your birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese's, right? To have Chuck E. Cheese's and have 25 of your friends come and be able to eat pizza and play games and do the stuff there. I think we had Monica's birthday and Zoe, no, one of the kids' birthday, Zoe. And uh, they were terrified of Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> so there went that whole plan, uh, right? You get there and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be fun. And then Chuck E. Cheese comes out and like half the kids were terrified. So, but that used to be what a big birthday wish was back when um, we were kids, our kids were younger. But nowadays, children are asking for iPhones, right? They're asking for tablets. I've seen kids under 10 years old that have electronics that I can't even afford at 50, 52 years old. Um, they're asking for those things, PS5 gaming systems, these virtual reality gaming systems that are close to $1,000 or more, some of them. They're asking for those gadgets and electronic devices that cost hundreds or even thousands of dollars. And they want their birthday parties not to just have a pony or be at Chuck E. Cheese, but they want to go to Hershey Park or Six Flags. And it's, it, birthday wishes have gotten bigger, right, uh, than when we were younger. If you could ask God for anything for this church this year, what would you ask him for? What would you ask the Lord for, for your church, for this church? I trust if you're here on a Sunday night in late June that you consider this your church that you have a love for what God is doing in this church. But if you could ask God for anything for this church, what would you ask him for? My great claim on God for this church is that the message of Jesus Christ, the message of him crucified, what he did at the cross, will go forward from this church unobstructed. Amen? I believe that's what the Lord wants. He wants that message to go forward under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And it should be hard for anyone in Harper's Ferry and surrounding communities to go to hell because the witness of Christ is so pure and is so strong from this church. Amen. Let's make a great claim on God. God use us. Help us not to squander the opportunities. Help us not to just be treading water. God, help us to be making an impact. Amen. For your kingdom in these last days. I'm believing God. I'm asking that he'll give us more souls than we've ever seen in any previous year. This year. Give us more souls, God, this year than we've seen ever in the history of this church. Amen. We ought to be asking the Lord for that. For souls to be saved. And that we would have a part in seeing those people come to know Jesus. We ought to say, God, would you use each one of us? I'm praying this as a pastor which includes myself. If I'm going to be the pastor and, and be the leader of the church, I've got to lead by example, amen? But I'm praying, God, that you would give each one of us an opportunity to reach at least one, at least one, and that they would respond and say yes to Jesus, amen? If each one of us did that, theoretically, we could double in the amount of people who are coming to our church, amen? And it's not so we can boast of how many we have coming, but each person represents a soul, Amen. That Jesus needs to get a hold of it. Each one of us could at least reach one in this next year for the Lord. As we point people to Jesus, as we point them to the cross, what might God do in this church? Amen. I'm asking God for more than 50% of our teenagers and adults to have personally experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit in this church. The sign out by the road says we're Pentecostal, right? So many Pentecostal fellowships, large denominations have their Pentecostal in name only and less, less than 10% of their adherents, the people who go to their churches, have ever even been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it's God's intention for every believer to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I'm praying, God, would you do it here? Would you pour out your spirit? Our young people, more than they need a relevant message from God's word, they need that. More than they need to be uh, 
fellowship with and have relationships built with them, they need the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Because long after we're gone, the generations that go before them, how many know they're going to need the Holy Spirit to lead them, to guide them, and to empower them should the Lord tarry? And I don't believe he's going to tarry too much longer. But we need our young people. We need adults who have not experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God, that God would pour out his spirit upon them. That's really what revival is all about. Amen. God's Holy Spirit moving and operating as he desires to. I'm asking God that he would send us 10 to 15 young married families. Amen. God, we need to reach young married families in our community. We need this church to be reaching out to the young uh, couples in, our, in our, our area. We need to be reaching out to young adults. God, give us some young adults that we can minister to, that we can pour the love of Jesus into, that we can see Christ formed in their lives. We ought, we ought to be praying for that. We want the work of God that's going on here at Bolivar Pentecostal Church. We want it to continue for years to come. Amen? And so we need God to use us, to give us wisdom, to give us His strategies in reaching every part of our community from cradle to the grave with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? We need to be asking God for some big things, things that really matter, amen? Things that when, like we said this morning, when the trumpet sounds, it's really going to matter um, what we're asking Him for. And I believe the Lord wants to do that in our church. I'm asking and believing God to bring each one in this congregation to a deeper level of spiritual maturity and commitment so that each person is fulfilling their God-given function. Your function may not be my function, but that doesn't mean you don't have a function or a role that's important. Amen? And may God help us to understand, each one of us, our God-given role and function within this body of believers. And 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12 tells us that we're all members of one body. And if one member is not functioning correctly, how many know you stub your toe? The rest of your body says, ouch, with your toe. Amen? And that's the way it is in church. If we're not all functioning as we need to, we're not at full strength doing what God has called and purposed us to do, then we're, we're sick. We're going to have problems. But God, give us spiritual maturity and commitment so that each one of us are fulfilling our God-given function, not just spirit-filled. We want to be spirit-filled. We're Pentecostal, but we also need to be spirit-controlled. Amen? God, I want my life under the control of your Holy Spirit. Let's not ask God for small things anymore let's make a great claim on God for our individual lives what do you want God to do in your own life in this upcoming year let's make a great claim on God for our families do you have loved ones that need Jesus that need a miracle in their life let's make a great claim on God what about our community what about our church what big things can we ask God to do if it was possible then we probably don't need to ask God right we could just do it ourselves. But ask God for the impossible. Ask God for something that requires His divine, supernatural help. And let's believe God that He wants to move in response to those cries tonight. Amen. Make a great claim on God. Luke chapter 18. If you're able to stand and you'd like to tonight, we're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. You can be seated tonight. In this passage in Luke 18, I think there's four truths that we can see. Four truths about making a great claim on God that I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us about tonight. Number one, will God find faith on the earth? Will he find faith 
on the earth. If God were to visit your home, if God were to visit our church, if he was to visit this world we live in, would he find faith? Many have said that the currency of the kingdom of God, that which, which spends in God's kingdom, is not money from the United States of America. Amen. The American dollar doesn't really spend in God's kingdom. But the currency of God's kingdom is faith. Will we believe God? And when we just evidence the right kind of faith, the kind of faith God is looking for, not any old faith, but biblical faith, that's the currency that spins in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. If God were to visit us today, would he find faith? Or would he find self-sufficient, prideful, self-righteous people? What is your faith in tonight? Where, do you, where are you placing your trust? Many things in our world, it, it shows us uh, where our trust is. When we have heart attacks and we have headaches, man puts his faith in bare aspirin, right? And a low cholesterol diet. And that might be a wise thing. Amen? There is some help in that. But why don't we turn to the Lord? I'm not saying we can't have medicine and its helps. Thank God for that and the wisdom he's given doctors to help us. But how often is Jesus the last resort when we're facing something in our physical bodies? Jesus wants to heal. When we have hyperactive children, man puts his faith in Ritalin anymore. Psychotherapy, the world's solutions for some of these problems. When I grew up, and I'm not saying this is the case in every situation, but when I was growing up, a lot of times the Board of Education applied to the seat of understanding, if you know what I mean, corrected a lot of the problems of hyperactivity. And not again, not all of it's like that. Sometimes there are some chemical problems. There are some extenuating circumstances where a child needs professional help. But a lot of times it's a lack of discipline in the home that a child started out at three years old with, and now they're a teenager. Well, now that they've been 12, 14 years without any discipline, it's hard to establish it once they're 18. We better understand what God's Word tells us about raising our children uh, in His precepts and with discipline. For success in life, man puts his faith in higher education. Is there anything wrong with higher education? No. But God's not operating His kingdom based on how many initials you have after your name. Amen? We ought to be pursuing the best education that we can and that we need for our job, how God would have us to go in that, in that area. And certainly, we need people in higher education to speak the truth of God's Word um, that are doctorates, that are PhDs, that are, have a master's degree. Because we've got enough other people speaking foolish. They have a PhD, they have a doctorate or a master's de degree, but they have no common sense regarding the things of God. Amen? And so if we need to understand education isn't the solution to success. Knowing the Lord is the solution. The fear of God will bring great success in our lives. When children experience abuse in a home, man too often, especially in America, puts his faith in the psychologist or the psychiatrist. Pretty soon they've got them so drugged up that the, the uh, side effects of their treatment is worse than the original problem uh, from the abuse. And we need to be praying and saying, God, give us discernment. Give us wisdom. Our church needs to be a place where God could find faith. Amen? We're not talking about the faith that the people in the world have. People have faith, even those who are agnostic and atheist, who claim that there is no God, or if there is, they don't believe that he, that he has any bearing on their life. They're exhibiting a type of faith. They have a faith in themselves. They have a faith in evolution. They have a faith in all kinds of other things. Misplaced objects of faith. But God needs to find proper faith, biblical faith in his church. Amen? We need to be a people that are evidencing proper uh, faith in Jesus Christ, who the word tells us he is, and proper faith in all that he's accomplished for us to give us life and life more abundantly. And that was all purchased for us at Calvary. We need to be making great claims on God in an altar of prayer. But how often in our daily walk with the Lord, in our being in church week after week after week, how often do we get too busy to even kneel in prayer, to spend some time alone in God's presence, 
We need to be making a great claim on God. Why isn't God moving in a lot of churches? Because people are not praying. They're not seeking His face. They're not crying out to God. And if the only prayer that we pray is God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for our food. In Jesus' name, amen. How many know our prayer life needs to go a little bit deeper than that? That's great for a three-year-old. But if we've been serving the Lord decades, we should have the ability to make a great claim on God. Amen. To kneel before Him and to pray for strongholds to be torn down. How often would God find us bickering if He were to come and visit us in the church today? How often would God find us complaining and moaning about frivolous matters instead of believing God for greater things? How often has our religion taken the place of our relationship with God? And instead of finding faith, God just comes and He finds our dead works that we think make us holy, but are really nothing more than just wheels in motion, dead, dry, religious activity. Amen? God wants a real living relationship with us. He wants His Spirit to move in us and through us for His kingdom's cause. And that's what He's looking for so number one, will God find faith? Will Jesus find faith on the earth when he returns? Number two tonight from Luke chapter 18, what will it take to cultivate an atmosphere of faith? We must be like the widow in verse five. What was she like? What was her character like? As we read those verses a few moments ago, she was relentless, wasn't she? She wasn't going to quit until she got what she was asking for. Are we that way in our petitioning to God? Do we read his promises and then say, God, I'm holding you to your promise. You said you would do this. And God, I'm claiming that promise right now. Not because I deserve it, because none of us deserve anything. If God never did anything else for us, we don't deserve anything. He doesn't owe us a thing. But Lord, I'm asking you this because you said I'm a joint heir with Jesus. Amen. And because he's worthy, he's deserving, and I'm in Christ, God, that's why I'm asking you for healing. That's why I'm asking you for provision, amen? That's why I'm asking you for wisdom for the situation that I'm facing, or peace in the midst of this overwhelming storm. He doesn't give it to us because he looks down and sees us, and he says, oh, Pastor Eric is praying, so let me meet his need. No, he looks down and he sees Pastor Eric, hopefully, hidden in Christ, and he's going to bless his son. Amen. He's going to bless those who have their faith where it should be in Jesus Christ, his one and only son. And that's what he's going to respond to. We must be relentless like the widow in verse five. We must be persistent. Ask and keep on asking. Seek, keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Amen. We must be expectant in our faith. Somebody else may tell us, well, God's not going to answer you, but we don't. They're, they're just chattering in the background when they say that because we expect God to do what he said he would do in his word. Amen. This widow was expectant that she was going to get what she was asking for, that she was justified in requesting what she was uh, requesting in this passage in Luke 18. We must do away with apathy. We must do away with complacency, being pew potatoes. Amen. We've got a lot of pew potatoes in the modern church. Just because you're in church, it makes you a churchgoer. It doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than you being in a garage makes you a car, right? Being in church and seeking after God and saying, God, I need you today, that may be something different. But just because you're in the building doesn't make you a Christian. It makes you a churchgoer. God, help us not to be apathetic, indifferent, complacent. So many have gotten that way. How many do we know? Growing up in the church, they have fallen by the wayside. And that's what has captured them, is apathy and indifference, complacency. They've become jaded because of the attacks of the enemy that they've seen. We don't need to become uh, complacent in our comfort zones. We need to get up and start actively and passionately making great claims on God. God, this is what we need you to do. God, in our church, in our community, in our families, in our nation... God, we're going to make a great claim like our uh, fathers that we read about, our patriarchs in the Old Testament, who stood and they prayed. Abraham cried out and he said, God, forgive me. And he repented for the sins of his own nation, even though he hadn't done any of those things. 
he began to petition God to have mercy and to forgive him for the sins of his nation. What would happen in America if we would do that? God, forgive us for the sin of abortion. Forgive us for homosexuality and transgenderism, the corruption of sin and sexual immorality that's rampant in our nation. God, forgive us. Have mercy. We better be making a great claim on God because we know the story of Lot and there wasn't anybody in Sodom and Gomorrah who was standing in the gap. We better be standing in the gap and saying, God, have mercy. God, bring us to repentance. We need to be actively and passionately making great claims on God. There's got to be a dissatisfaction with the status quo. Well, I'm just going to coast through life. I don't want to disrupt the status quo. No, how many know the status quo needs to be disrupted in the body of Christ, in the modern church? We need the status quo to be interrupted by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We need Him to move. We need to have a disgust for the mundane, a disgust for dead, dry religion. We need to have no tolerance for just enough to get by. I'm not interested in just enough to get by. God, I want all that you have for me. I want it all, Lord God. I don't want to miss one treasure, one blessing, one promise that you've offered in your word. I don't want just enough to get by. I don't want that to be my mentality. God, I want to be passionate about what you're passionate about. I'm going to believe God for greater things. Amen. The Lord's trying to move his last day's church to that place. Amen. Where we're asking him for greater things. Acts 17, verse 6. Acts 17, verse 6. And when they found him not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the cities, crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come here also. And then Acts 19 and verse 10. This continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Do we have the testimony that we're reading in those two verses? What are people saying about us and our passion for God? Do they hear us making a great claim on God? Believing God for the impossible. And are they saying, like they did in Acts 17, these people are turning the world upside down. How many know if the world says it's upside down, in God's eyes it's probably right side up. Amen? And we need to be impacting our world with this message of Jesus and what He's come to do. Amen? We ought to have a testimony, even out in a secular world, that God's up to something. Amen? What about those weird people over at BPC? over by the campground. Something's going on over there. People keep going and getting healed. People keep going in there and getting delivered. People keep going in there and something changes about their life. They're not who they used to be. Praise God. That's the testimony we need. Amen? God is up to something. And the testimony of the disciples in the early church in two years, all of Asia had heard the gospel because of a group that started with 120 in the upper room said, I'm not just going to sat be satisfied with mundane, mediocre Christianity. I'm going to make a great claim on God. I'm going to make myself available for God to use me. And all of a sudden, all of Asia in two years had heard the gospel. What could God do in our lives if we would express that kind of faith? God, I'm believing you. I'm trusting you. Has our faith turned our world upside down for the glory of God? We need to pray that it would. Amen. Number three from Luke chapter 18. What examples do we have of people who made a great claim on God? What about Noah? Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make an ark of gopher wood. Room shall you make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Genesis 6, 22 God gave Noah all these instructions, gave him in his mind a picture, a detailed picture of what this ark, this boat was supposed to look like. It had never rained, much less flooded like he was about to see. And how many people thought Noah was crazy? What are you doing, right? Noah responded, Genesis 6, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. If we say we have faith, we better have faith obedience. Amen. It's easy to say with your mouth, I believe God. I have faith. But when the test comes, 
will the obedience show that the faith is really there. Amen? Will God find faith when he returns? Despite ridicule, doubts, being unpopular, Noah did everything God told him to do. He believed God to save him and his family when the rest of the world was doing their own thing and going to be destroyed because of it. And how many people did Noah see saved? Eight. Right? Eight. Again, if each one of us could reach one, what a difference it would make. If each one of us reached eight, because we would make a great claim on God, what did Noah's eight do for the rest of humanity? What a huge impact, right? Because Noah said, even if it's for eight people, my own family, that's the only people left who will trust God and believe God with me, it's worth it for the eight. Amen? Do you see that? What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Daniel chapter 3, starting with verse 15. Now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made. This is Nebuchadnezzar talking. He said, well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. What a fierce faith, amen? What an unrelenting faith. God has promised us that he would be with us and help us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow to you, O king. We're going to trust our God to the very end. These Hebrew boys stared death in a fiery furnace right in the face. Amen? It was a real threat. They had probably witnessed it from previous offenses in this uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's rule. They stared death right in the face. They believed God to preserve their lives, even if he had to raise them from the dead. Amen? Do we have that kind of relentless faith? What about Samson, Judges 16, starting with verse 23? Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad, the little boy, that held him by the hand, Suffer or allow me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house stands that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and there were upon the, ro the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray you, and strengthen me, I pray you, only this once. One more time, God. I've sensed your presence upon my life. You've used me to destroy the enemies of Israel many times before. But one more time, God, would you remember me? Oh, God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two little pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the Lord's, and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Samson, in the story, made one last great claim on God. Amen? And that many would say, well, isn't that suicide? No, it was sacrifice. Picturing the death that Jesus would give for us. Sacrificing himself so that God's purposes can be accomplished. Do we have that kind of faith? A faith like Samson, a faith like Noah, a faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Faith requires obedience. And the Bible says in James that faith without works is dead. We can see that, it, that proven in each one of these examples that we've looked at tonight. They didn't just profess, they 
demonstrated their belief, their firm belief, that God was able to do what He promised. Number four, the last thing from Luke chapter 18. Why do we need to make a great claim on God? Well, have you turned on CNN? Have you turned on MSNBC? Have you turned on Newsmax or Fox News lately? If you have, you ought to know why we need to make a great claim on God. We need God to move in a powerful way because of the times we're living in. Amen? Jesus says, you know by the signs on the trees when summer is near, when the seasons are changing, you better know when the return of the Lord is getting close. And it's getting close, folks. The times that we're living in, we need to be making a great claim on God. We're living in the last days. Amen. Matthew 24, Jesus talked about these days, and we're living in these very verses. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. We're living in the beginning of sorrows. We have been for a long time. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. God help us that we're not among those whose love grows cold because of iniquity abounding. We're seeing iniquity abound more so than ever before in our lifetime right now. But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I believe because of technology and the advancements in our world, the gospel is going forward at a greater rate than it ever has before. Nations that you can't legally go in and share the gospel in an open air service, they can pull down a satellite signal and they're hearing the gospel because of technology, because of the things that God is using to get the gospel to every nation in the world. Everyone is going to be without excuse. Amen. Not everyone's going to get saved. It would be nice if, what is it, 7.7 .7 billion people, almost 8 billion on this planet, if all of them would be saved. That's not going to happen. But as many as we can, we need to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I believe we're seeing that happen. And once the Father says it's enough, Go get my church. I believe it's going to happen soon. That's when the end will come. The great tribulation will begin. And there's going to be a wrapping up of all of this judgment once and for all for sin. Why should we be making a great claim on God because of the times we're living in? Number two, for ourselves. We need to be making a great claim on God for ourselves. We need to get into God's word. We need to have faith created. Faith comes by Hearing and hearing by the word of God. We don't need to be in church and in the word less as Jesus' return gets closer. We need to be in his presence and his word in prayer and in church more. Because we need faith like we've never needed it before. Amen? And the Lord wants to create faith in our hearts by us getting into his word. Faith to believe God for things you've never imagined were even possible in your life and through your life. We need to make a great claim on God for your own personal life. We need to be making a great claim on God for this post-Christian generation that we live in. And it's sad to say, but our nation was a Christian nation. But I think we're at a point where we're in a post-Christian nation. God can change that, and I believe He wants to one more time through His church. But we're living in this post-Christian generation. They're watching us. They're searching for real answers to life's questions. But they, many of them turned away from religion and from God. And we need to show them who Jesus is. And that, that he's the answer for the things that they're searching for. We need to make a great claim on God for the unsaved. They don't know how lost they are, but we better know how lost they are. We ought to cry out for mercy for the unsaved. How will they hear about God if we don't intercede? Amen. If we don't witness if we don't speak up, if we don't make a great claim on God, there's many people 
who are going to be lost, and who are going to spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And it was not created for human beings to be there. It was created for the devil and his angels because of their rebellion. But if we don't tell them, if we don't make a great claim, how will they know that they need Jesus in their lives? And so God's telling us tonight, he needs us as his church to be making a great claim on God. Amen? Ask God for the impossible. Ask him for big things. Ask him for your family. Don't quit asking for him to reach your unsaved loved ones. Amen. My mom has nine brothers and sisters. Her side of the family. All were raised in church by my grandma who is with the Lord now. Several of them has, have turned away from the Lord. And I believe in God is going to save my family. Amen. On my mom's side. Maybe you have loved ones close to you that are not living for the Lord. We need to take it seriously how dangerous it is. Life can be snuffed out like that. James tells us that life is a vapor waiting to pass. We need to say, God, we want you to save our families. We want our unsaved loved ones to have an opportunity, whether it's us or someone else, that God would use uh, someone to tell them that they need to repent and to show them his love, to show them that he can forgive, he can cleanse, he can give them a new start. We need to believe the Lord for that. Would you stand with me tonight? I want us to close and respond to God's word tonight. Making a great claim on God. We've got so many examples in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith that we see there. All the different people who believed God and had to demonstrate not just a profession of faith, but obedience to back it up. May that be what God finds in us. Amen. That we say we believe God, we say we're trusting Him, but He sees that we mean business because of the claim that we're making upon Him. Amen? If we'll understand how awesome, how limitless, how sovereign God really is, we'll ask Him for big things. And let's ask Him for reformation. Amen? Only God can turn this ship around for the United States of America and bring us to repentance. Amen? Only God can bring a revival in these last days where we could see a move of His Spirit like we've seen in previous generations. I believe God wants to do it, but He's looking for some people who will cry out and say, God, we've got to have You. There has to be a desperation. There has to be a faith. We have to lay hold on His promises if we're going to see these things happen in these last days. But I believe God wants to move in our families, in our lives, in our church, in our community. If you're satisfied with mundane, dead works, going through the motions, religion, then I don't want you to respond to this altar call. If all you want to do is not make any waves, then you just stay comfortable right in your pew. But if you realize tonight that you love Jesus more than anything, and you're passionate about your relationship with God becoming stronger and stronger, and you want with all your heart tonight to make a great claim on God, however He would direct you, however He would prompt you in the areas that we've talked about tonight, and I want you to find an altar of prayer up here in the front or there at your seat. And say, God, we're believing you for this. We're believing you for some things that are going to really make a difference in eternity. Not the temporary things. But God, those things which really are going to matter a thousand years from now. Amen. Can we find some time to pray tonight and to seek his face? And let's let him do a work in our hearts. James is going to lead us in a couple of songs. But let's find a place to pray. And then we'll close together in a prayer dismissal in just a few moments.
status quo. God, we're going to ask you for big things. Not so that we can make a name for ourselves, but so that his name might be lifted up. Amen. That Jesus would be the glory because of our faith. Amen. Let's ask him to stretch our faith and to make it something that's pleasing to him tonight. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence that we can sense in this room tonight. God, help us to be completely dissatisfied with mundane, mediocre Christianity. God, help us to be dissatisfied with the status quo. God, let us see that we need to not only say that we believe you, but God, we need to demonstrate that we believe you by our obedience. God, help us to lay everything at your feet one more time, to walk in complete obedience to you, God. Help us to be 